Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, uh, wherever you are. Thank you for joining the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of 17th of February today. Uh, today, we are uh, delighted, uh, pleased, and honored to host our colleague Oli Niemi from uh, Sweden. Oli is a professor in uh, groundwater modeling at the Department of Earth Sciences at Uppsala University in Sweden, leading the geohydrology research group. Her area positions include example research professor at Technical Center Research Center of Finland, visiting professor at Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden, and research associate at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in US in California. Her research involves modeling and characterization of flow and transport in porous and fractured media, with applications ranging from energy challenges, such as geothermal energy, CCS, CO2 storage, and disposal of nuclear waste to environmental protections. In recent years, her research has had a strong focus on processes related to geological storage of CO2, where she, for example, has participated at the leadership level as a coordinator and work package leader to several European uh, funded uh, research and development projects, as well as projects in the Baltic Sea region. As part of the EU finance research, she has been one of the key developers of Helets in Israel CO2 injection site, where scientifically motivated CO2 injection experiments have been carried out to investigate CO2 trapping. Her talk will have an emphasis on the findings of these experiments, especially in terms of CO2 residual trapping. Thank you very much, Auli, for graciously accepting our invitation to give this lecture. It's our true pleasure and honor to host you today. Uh, please, uh, the audience note, uh, Auli's lecture uh, will last for about half an hour, 30 minutes, followed by questions. Like always, please do text your questions in the chat box. Sebastian will take them, and uh, we are very much looking forward to your engagement. So do not wait till end of the talk. Post your question anytime you feel appropriate. Your question will motivate your colleagues and friends to also post their questions. And we would uh, be very much delighted to have an engaging and dynamic discussion session as well. Without any further ado, uh, Auli, the stage is all yours and thanks a lot. And we are looking very much forward to hearing your lecture. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me here. This is really an, uh, a great pleasure. pleasure and honor to, to, to participate in this very interesting seminar series. So I will talk about uh, residual, satur uh, uh, residual saturation and a related concept, critical saturation in CO2 geological storage uh, in the light of our uh, field injection experiments in Israel. Uh, on, on, on this page I will, are the co-workers that have mostly contributed to the recent analysis, my colleagues at Uppsala and also Jakob Benzabat from Israel, who was heading the field work in, in these experiments. On this, this page, I list uh, far more names. This was, these were big experiments, and a lot of people made their contribution to this work. So my, my acknowledgments to them. Uh, I guess all of you know about this uh, key trapping mechanism in CO2 storage. We are familiar with the plot on, on the left-hand side with the trapping contributions evolving with time. Residual trapping is this part here that is uh, increasing first and then decreasing. Uh, it's this uh, part where um, CO2 gets uh, trapped as immobile blobs when water has re-entered the system. And it's a, it's a significant uh, trapping mechanism that is uh, providing trapping contributions. Another way to look at the residual saturation is that we think that we are injecting CO2 in a formation and it starts to travel up deep on, on the figure on the right hand side and it moves on and on and leaves behind this residually trapped CO2 and finally in this case everything becomes immobile, the mobile, mobile CO2 has, has uh, been immobilized. 
So uh, it's this residual trapping that we are trying to determine in the field conditions in our experiments. And this is what I will talk about. But to remind you of this, uh, uh, how this looks in our models, we have this relative permeability functions. And, and we have here on the, on the y-axis, uh, gas relative permeability, liquid relative permeability, and increasing liquid saturation going from left to right and vice versa for the gas saturation and uh, if we are if um, the system starts to to dry the relative uh, gas starts to enter enter the system i don't know if you see my cursor so uh, gas starts to enter the system gas we, we see your cursor oh, yeah we, we good, see it yeah. good uh, gas as uh, gas relative permeability increases then uh, if the water starts to re-enter we are uh, wetting again uh, we are following another path down uh, the gas saturation is decreasing and finally we reach this point where where uh, uh, all the gas is immobile but we still have some gas saturation in this case 0.2 uh, percent left and this gas is immobile and this is how it uh, manifests itself in these functions what water saturation is then the the other or moving the other way around this is actually now laboratory data uh, this is done by the Sally Benson group in Stanford determining for, for our core and this we used as kind of a, some kind of basis also when we went to the field but this is how this kind of data you can determine in the laboratory now, this is an outline of what I am going to talk about, how to determine residual saturation in situ. Then I say a few words about our site in Israel and the residual trapping experiments there. And then I discuss the results, both in terms of residual saturation and then this concept that is not so much discussed in the context of CCS, namely critical saturation, which we encountered also in when analyzing our results. And then finally, I give some conclusions and implications of our results. So how to determine residual trapping in situ? Uh, this was first proposed for the Otway site in Australia. So we were not the first ones to come up with this idea, but we have been adding our own ideas to this and as far as I know, it's only them and us who have done this kind of dedicated field experiments towards this end. So the idea is that um, we can do a hydraulic test, thermal test, tracer test, ter tracer test with, with uh, gas partitioning tracers that partition into the CO2 before we have any CO2 in the system and after we have created a residually trapped zone. So this phases one and three in this plot. And then in between, so the difference in these tests, the hydraulic test, if you inject water and withdraw water, if you heat the system, make a thermal test or, or this tracer test, the difference in these responses tells us how much CO2 we have in, in the system. Then creating this residually trapped zone, it's a, it's a challenge of its own. But there are basically two ways uh, to do it. You First, you inject CO2 to your reservoir layer, and then you withdraw fluids until you are at the residual stage. And I will say a few words about how to, how to determine this, that you know that you are at the residual stage. Another way is that you inject CO2 in your formation, and then you inject uh, water with, uh, saturated with CO2 to push the mobile CO2 away. And then it's important that the water is saturated with CO2, so you are not dissolving your, dissolving your CO2 as well. So this was the principal approach we used. And now I will go more into the, the uh, actual work. So this is the site in, in Helets is at Helets Israel. This is a scientifically motivated CO2 injection experiment site for supercritical CO2 injection at the layer that is 1.6 kilometers deep. A thin layer, two layers, um, total thickness 11 meters. And this is at one and over one and a half kilometers depth. 
And this site is a depleted oil field that is that was quite well investigated before we started anything. And we drilled two dedicated experimental wells in the outskirts where there was never any oil. So it's a saline, saline conditions there. And, and we had a very comprehensive characterization of those, um, even more so near those uh, dedicated wells. And they were then instrumented for quite comprehensive monitoring and sampling. And the, the site was developed in the frame of actually four different EU R&D projects, Mustang Trust, Panacea and CO2 Quest, mainly Mustang and Trust. Uh, this is how it looks on the site. So these are the two boreholes. This one the, is already instrumented for all the monitoring. These wells have the pressure and temperature sensors at the uh, high pressure YouTube fluid sampling, optical fiber in this well. And then they are also fluid, fluid uh, injection or withdrawal in this well. This one has only withdrawal. Uh, in this picture, the other well is still under construction. Then when you instrument uh, these wells uh, for such great depth, you have uh, quite massive uh, equipment just to lower your tools, like we see in the middle figure here. And then the lines from these wells go to this uh, container where we have the monitoring equipment. In this case, uh, I'm showing the YouTube panel for the high pressure uh, fluid sampling. The actual uh, injection kit is here. Uh, the CO2 injection kit and in the background there is the water injection and treatment facilities and you see the CO2 tank here we, we the, the CO2 to our experiments came with the trucks and was stored in a tank so the residual trapping experiments that we carried out with this specific purpose of, of characterizing residual trapping were carried out in 2016 and 2017 the first experiment was based on um, using the difference in the response of hydraulic and thermal tests before and after creating the residually trapped zone. And the zone of residually trapped CO2 was created by CO2 injection followed by fluid withdrawal until, uh, until the residual state was achieved. Uh, to determine when we are at the residual state, we used something called indicator tracer, which we had been investigating before theoretically, but in practice, it was not so helpful. But what was helpful for, for us was that we had two pressure sensors in our test interval, and those allowed us to see if we have gas or water, just water in the interval. So if there was still gas coming, if there was mobile gas in the system or if it was just water that was coming. So this was a useful tool. Uh, in the second experiment that was done one year later, in addition to doing this hydraulic and thermal tests, we also used partitioning tracer krypton uh, to, to see how much CO2 there was in the system. And in, in the second experiment, the zone of the residually trapped CO2 was created by first injecting CO2 to the reservoir layers, followed by injection of CO2 saturated water to push the mobile CO2 away. So this is now the timeline of the first residual trapping experiment from 2016. You see the dates there. And this part here is uh, actually related to creating the residually trapped zone. So first CO2 injection, there was a heating, the other heating was outside this plot. And then the well was open and first the CO2 was self-releasing spontaneously together with water. So there was kind of a geyser-like geyser -like behavior. And then, uh, then that was, when that was kind of becoming slower, we started pumping and, uh, and producing. Uh, producing fluids until we deem that now we are at the residual stage. Then uh, these parts here actually are the hydraulic tests, water was pumped, uh, withdrawal hydraulic tests before and after creating the residual trapped zone. And this heating test had also its reference elsewhere. So this is how it looked on the, on the site. Uh, the, like I said, the CO2 was coming with the, I'm having problems seeing my cursor, uh, 
uh, with, uh, was coming with the truck and stored in the tank. There is some the, more pictures of the injection system and opening the well, some monitoring for the what flow rates, etc. And this is how how the downhole pressure and temperature look from these sensors. We have here now the layers, these reservoir layers at one and 1.6 kilometers of depth, and this is the pressure and and temperature series for this. I mean, we see, for example, here where is water injection, CO2 injection, pressure increasing. Here we have here we are opening the well and get this oscillating behavior from from the self release, and here we are pumping fluids, and here we deem that now we are at the residual states. And here is actually the second hydraulic test. Here is the first one, and temperature effects on the on the right panel. Now we uh, did model uh, with the TAF2 simulator uh, this entire sequence. Uh, we, we had quite good data constraints available from the site characterization program. I actually forgot to say when I was showing the site picture. So, so we actually made an entire special edition uh, to International Journal of Greenhouse Gas Control 2016. Uh, about the site characterization program. So, so there was quite a lot of data and understanding of the site properties before we did these experiments. So we put the uh, details of the well structure in our model and, and used this um, uh, data, including the characteristic curves that we are determining from the from in the laboratory. And and, and this uh, plot here shows one simulation example how the simulated CO2 distribution could, could have been. Now the results then, looking at the, how the pressure and temperature and flow rates matched, we could see that the, uh, varying the residual maximum residual gas saturation in the model really gave a very good signal. Uh, and so it was a very robust way of, of seeing what uh, matching our model. And in this case, uh, the residual saturation 0 0.1 instead of the laboratory determined 0 0.2 gave the best fit. Also the temperature data was fitted and the flow rate. So uh, we could fit this quite easily with uh, meaningful values, permeability values, porosity values, etc. that were we knew were kind of uh, relevant, um, that were obtained from the site characterization program. So the conclusions from this first experiment were that um, hydraulic test gave a strong signal and a good estimate of the overall residual gas saturation. So it, the signal was uh, very clear and we saw a clear difference when we were varying that parameter. Temperature data provided additional information about the gas distribution between the two reservoir layers. So it helped us to, to calibrate further the model. And again, I mentioned here that the two pressure sensors gave an idea if we had a mobile gas in the system or if it was what, how much gas we had in the interval. Uh, also, the model analysis suggested that most of the injected gas tended to go to the upper layer, and this makes sense, of course, with them, with CO2. Uh, and then uh, the estimated uh, maximum residual saturation was somewhat lower than what was determined in the laboratory. The next experiment is here, at one year later. This was a little bit more um, complicated uh, series of uh, stages um, here the here the creation of the residually trapped zone was done by CO2 injection and then again opening the well and letting itself release a while and then then injecting water saturated with CO2. It was done in steps because there were some technical challenges in doing this. Uh, then the reference tests were the heating test again, and then um, water and tracer injection and production, and the same here after creating the residual trapped zone. And this is how it looked uh, in the field uh, uh, during this, uh, this second experiment here in the upper panels is the, the partitioning tracer injection is going on. This is a krypton tracer we used. Uh, here you see the 
it was injected into the injection line and some pictures of the sampling. In this case, the high pressure fluid sampling became very important for these tracer concentrations. Again, uh, the downhole pressure and temperature distribution here we can see from these two sensors. Uh, and again, this was matched in our modeling. And this time we also had this tracer recovery data. And uh, here is the tracer breakthrough uh, for the reference tracer system where we had no CO2 in the formation. And then when we had the CO2 there. And it can be said that the tracer arrival without any CO2 in the system was uh, very easy to match. Actually, the model that was calibrated in the first experiment uh, could be used almost as such or as such to, to get a good match to this um, first tracer experiment. But then for the second tracer experiment, uh, we had great difficulty in duplicating this uh, later peak here in the tracer recovery. And we did, uh, we did all possible variations to our model that we could think of, including partitioning coefficients, detailing the well structure and varying the formation properties and partitioning coefficients of the tracer and everything. And we even did a kind of stochastic heterogeneous models because we, ha we have quite some understanding of the heterogeneity structure also from porosity locks and so on. But uh, it was, we didn't capture this, this late peak. And then finally, we did uh, manage to, to, to match that uh, with this kind of model where, again, the, most of the CO2 enters the upper reservoir and water and tracer tend to enter the top of the lower reservoir. And these things we can explain. But then the delay we could only <laughs> uh, duplicate by, by blocking the fl fluid flow for, for a few hours uh, and then letting it come. And, and so, in other words, we could not physically explain this with the things that were in the existing models at that time. And then we started to revisit or visit a topic called critical saturation, especially Ramin Mogadashi, who is now close to finishing his PhD, uh, has been working on this. So this is a concept that uh, I guess those of you who are in the oil and gas industry are familiar with, but it's not, um, it's not much discussed or considered in CCS. Uh, I have seen some, um, we have seen some papers from uh, Benson Group in the, some discussion related to laboratory experiments, but not much even, even from them and otherwise pretty much not discussed topic. So what happens in, uh, what this critical saturation means that uh, we have a system here on the left-hand side of our panel, we have a trapped, trapped gas surrounded by water. And then when CO uh, gas starts to re-enter, in, in our case, we were opening the well, we were pumping, so we were lowering the pressure and that caused uh, exclusion of, of gas from the aqueous phase and also expansion of the gas. So, um, so uh, not, we were not injecting CO2. So this is another type of process. So then when the gas, uh, gas um, saturation starts to increase, the system does not become mobile right away, but it takes some time for the pathways to get connected. And then, then the phase becomes mobile. And what we see how this uh, uh, manifests itself in the in these relative permeability functions is that that instead of this normal uh, drying, wetting, and then maybe thinking that okay, once once then uh, the gas starts to enter the system again, or the gas saturation increases, we would go back up more quickly. Mobile. I really have problems with my my pointer. So. Uh, we are not going to go up right away like most of the models do or assume, but it takes some time. The, ga the gas saturation has to increase quite a bit so that the pathways get connected. 
and we call this or this this value is called the critical gas saturation and this difference here we we don't we don't mark with this sg mob and even after the after the uh, we have kind of the, the gas phase has become mobile it that the increase in the relative gas permeability is not as fast as we would think from based on the previous curves so we implement this this was not implemented at least not in the tough simulator and i wonder if it's implemented in other ccs simulators so we implemented that and surprise uh, to our great joy this actually explained the behavior that we observed so by varying this sg mob this difference term here with values that are meaningful values from oil and gas industry we we don't have this kind of values from from ccs so with this kind of a value 0 0.05 we get a very nice match and then depending on the value this the timing of this peak and its height varies a little bit so we were very happy about this uh, that we could with this kind of a um, uh, physically based explanation explain our observation now this slope here did not influence in our case too much this um, this uh, shape of of the model curve so uh, conclusions from from this so this observation is of course something we continue to work on this i will say a few words about this uh, now um but of course, this kind of uh, experiments, they are major experiments that have been done. Uh, we have learned quite a lot of lessons, and I will try to summarize some of them uh, quick, uh, shortly here. Now, we have published um, a special section of articles that recently was completed in the International Journal of Greenhouse Gas Control, so you can see much more details there. But if I try in a few slides to kind of summarize the conclusions and implications from these experiments. So the general, generally we can say that, that uh, uh, we have de developed procedures and interpretations for determining residual saturation in situ. And we believe that there are not that many similar uh, comparable experiments available. Uh, and the estimated residual gas saturation from these two experiments was similar uh, from both experiments, but it was less than the laboratory determined value. Now, we only had uh, one, one core sent to the laboratory, so of course that is a local value also. So then in terms of the methods to determine this residual saturation, this hydraulic and tracer and thermal test, so we can say that the hydraulic tests gave a clear signal concerning the overall effective residual saturation in the interval. It is some kind of an effective value, we have to point out. It, it doesn't say anything where the CO2 went. Thermal tests gave a good additional information about the gas distribution, and, and as did this uh, monitoring the pressure profile or, or what was the pressure difference between the two sensors in the test interval or set us, um, are, do we have, how much gas we have there, and or is it only liquid? And then finally, these partitioning tracers tests, in principle, they give more information, more detailed information, and even we could see that there is more channelized behavior, and we could observe this critical saturation behavior, but they are far more complicated to carry out. The equipment is is quite uh, sophisticated, and we actually had to replace the YouTube twice before we did these experiments. And uh, so it's kind of, it's much more elaborate, but in principle provides more information. Uh, then cr creating the residually trapped zone. Um, one can say that uh, even here, the flu fluid withdrawal, it's a, it's a relatively simple and robust method. Uh, it has been questioned that, uh, how do you know when you are at the residual stage, but, but we felt that, that this information of observing this um, pressure difference between uh, pressure difference in these two sensors in the interval gave a good, good indication of that. This injection of water saturated with CO2, it's more technically challenging. 
because it's it's quite difficult to optimally mix the water and CO2 in this one and a half kilometer deep borehole because the conditions vary along the depth. So it's easy that you have a system that is oversaturated and then you have some kind of gas blocking phenomena maybe there or it's undersaturated and, and then you are maybe dissolving your, your formation CO2 also. So maybe maybe almost more recommended this fluid withdrawal, I would say. Then this critical saturation, that was an observation that we made in this experiment. So, so um, this is a phenomenon that is relevant if gas saturation increases due to pressure decrease that in turn causes exolution and expansion rather than injection. This is well recognized in oil and gas industry, but not previously considered in CCS. Uh, but uh, it seems that it needs to be accounted uh, when modeling scenarios where unexpected pressure decrease takes place due to leakage or, or some, something like that and related gas exclusion and expansion. It has to be said that this is a safety enhancing phenomena because it, 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 it delays the possible leakage. So it's, it's kind of uh, good news. Now, uh, our work, ongoing work, uh, of course, we continue to analyze the field data, but we are also looking into this critical saturation, especially Ramin Mokadasi is looking at that now. We are looking now at the, at the pore scale processes um, to get a better understanding how this, how this happens in a CO2 brine system. And we are starting experiments with uh, Martin Plant's group in, at Imperial College, and we are doing modeling in, in collaboration with Stephen McDonald at Heriot Watt. But these are uh, just uh, start, these works are in progress or just starting. So I want to thank, thank, the finan thank you for listening and thank the financing organizations. And here is finally uh, some of the key references. So for the site characterization, we had, um, like I said, special ed edition in the International Journal of Greenhouse Gas Control. And then for these injection experiments, we have now recently appeared a special section in International Journal of Greenhouse Gas Control. The articles that I was citing here are listed on this, but um, that there are uh, two more articles. And then finally, the critical saturation is in this paper by Mokadashi et al. That, was, that is accepted now and should appear in print soon. And of course, we are very happy to discuss with you more if you are interested. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting, informative uh, presentation. Very unique case of really failed experience. And we see plenty of questions, of course, partly by those who spend a lot in lab so our key is about to see what happens in real life. So uh, Sebastian, the stage is all yours. Yes, um, thank you also from my side, Oli, for a really nice, nice talk. It's always great to see field data and people enjoy the modeling work like Hardy and myself. You sort of don't appreciate all the things that can go wrong when you try to actually do something in the field and um, with the CO2 that you, we inject so readily in our simulations doesn't inject that easily in, in the field. Um, as Hani said, lots and lots of interesting questions. The two that are very similar from Wilhelmine Van Rooyen and uh, Marty Bone, and they bring in Wilhelmine's questions, but they, as I said, they're very similar. And they ask, um, thank you for the, both thank you for the interesting talk. And they wonder, did you perform lab, lab experimental studies or have you done something on the Helitz core to see if your field observations could be um, observed in the lab? And specifically, or the trapping mechanisms and scalability from what you do, do in the, at the core scale versus the field scale. So is there any data available? Anything? Yes. So, so um, first of all, in terms of the residual saturation, I, I tried to say, but maybe it went fast. So, so we did determine this residual saturation in the laboratory, or actually it was a Stanford University's group that have a good, good equipment for that. So they were testing our course. In, in that sense. And then that value somehow we can compare to the value that we get in the field. But then in terms of the, if you mean the critical saturation phenomena. So this is, like I said, we are now starting to look at it in the laboratory in a very small scale. 
-hmm. but that's I, I cannot comment that yet. That's that's the work that will be done in collaboration with Imperial College. Staying on the sort of on the um, residual saturation, I just need to find the right question. Yeah. Um, so Bezat says theoretically one um, should expect residual saturations in a reservoir to be smaller than that measured in a core sample. Um, to compare the core and reservoir saturations, um, do you have any idea about the similarities between the capillary number? We, um, I don't think I have done, we have, we have not done that comparison. That should, of course, be. Okay. Th there are I'm, so many things that can be different, but, but this yeah. is, uh, yeah. Do you think there are any other reasons, and that's what Marty asked this, um, any other comments or thought that you could have, that you may have? Well, I mean, they, it's, it's obviously that you are, um, the core sample is just, uh, just one core, and, and this is, this is a 11 meters thick layer, so the scale is very different. So, so we can think also of the core, core sample as a point sample somehow. And the, the follow-up questions come flying in fast and furious um, in, in the most positive sense. Um, um, yeah, so Menji, Zhao, and again, Martia asked some very similar questions. So thank you for the interesting um, presentation. Could you elaborate further on how the reservoir was characterized? How heterogeneous was it? And Martia then asks um, how representative is what we measure in one core flux to the fields, if the field is very heterogeneous. So yeah, heterogeneous. The, the rock looked quite het homogeneous, actually. It didn't look too heterogeneous. But we, um, I mean, OK, the characterization, first of all, there was quite a lot of uh, laboratory testing on the cores. And then we did also, uh, and there were permeability testing on cores, quite, quite uh, uh, different laboratories that participated at that time to the Mustang project did testing. They did test other things and all of them also did a permeability testing. So, so that gave us a span of values. They were not, they were maybe 400 mil, 200 millidarcy to 400, I don't remember by heart now uh, exactly, but they gave, it, it was not a very wide span uh, of values. And then we did also a field experiment hydraulic test that gave kind of an um, total uh, value of the uh, kind of, a, how do you say, average value of the layer. Mm. And uh, then the heterogeneity we actually determined so that there was a porosity log. And uh, that was correlated to what we knew about poropermeability relationship. And and there was a study that that way came to some kind of a standard deviation for permeability, which we used in this, this uh, one sensitivity study. And do you remember what the spread was in permeability values in the field? Or? I, I don't remember, but I think it was something like between the, the permeability in this layer, let's say 200 millidarcy to four, 500 millidarcy. This was the okay. kind of variation. So it was not a big variation. Okay. Yeah, it's, that's reasonably homogeneous, probably. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions again. Very similar questions um, from one is from Yu Hang Wang and um, Meng Zhao asked a bit similar question. And they um, asked, wondering if you have monitored the distribution of residual trap feed in the feed test. Have you done any seismic geophysical surveys to detect the plume locations so you can actually try to match what you see in the simulator with what you see in the field in terms of the ex extent of the plume? Has, has any geophysics been done on the field? There was. Uh... There was a geophysical monitoring also in another experiment. The thing is that this is so deep and, and our, um, our amount of CO2 that was injected was so small that it could not really be detected from, from the surface. So okay. this, is, this is not like a Sleipner or <laughs> something <laughs> like that. So, so we could not directly by geophysics monitor it. It would have been, of course, even to have something in the borehole, but we didn't have that. There's one question um, from PZ Channel. Um, again, saying great talk and lots of comments. Oh, fantastic talk, really interesting talk. Thanking you. Um, great talk. Okay. Uh, thanks. How did you discount for the dissolution um, of CO2 in water or oil when you estimate the residual gas saturation? 
how did you discount for the dissolution? Right. Uh, I... Yeah, so, so if you some of the possibly account rather than discount. Yeah. So um, how do you consider that some of the CO two may have just dissolved? Well, in, in for the more in the models, you you take it into account. You have the dissolution included into the model. Yeah. Uh, of course, it's a kind of equilibrium dissolution in this this model, so it assumes instantaneous process. Um, but uh, but we tried in the field prevent the dissolution by injecting this saturated sat CO two saturated butter. Okay. In all all the cases where we had a CO two in the system, and we tried to create this residual system and and. And when we did the tracer experiment, we had water that had CO2 dissolved in it, so there should not be an ex excess dissolution. Um, and you mentioned it's depleted. The site that you use is a well-characterized depleted hydrocarbon field. So was there any trapped hydrocarbon phases around? We didn't. No, we didn't. I mean, this is um, this was the. Uh, we wanted to have it in a saline part where there should not be an what be oil, and we didn't observe any oil either. Abdul Rauf Ade asks again, "Great work! Um, how often do you plan to reevaluate the residual saturation in the field after injection to see if anything has is changing over time?" We we don't have a possibility to. These are very expensive experiments. Uh, so, so there. What we did after the first experiment, before going to the, we actually flushed the system. We were pumping until we didn't see, and we saw it that now it's no more CO two left. But this, after the second experiment, we didn't do that. So, so there should be still CO two left in the system. But, but now this, these are we don't have at at the moment the means to to go and and monitor. We never know if there's a potential funder listening to the talk. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. We want to come yeah. back to the audience. Who wants uh, to know? To yeah. Yeah. Do another feed experiment because it's great. It's fantastic data to to have. Um, Yuang asks, could you comment on the relative significance of the residual trapping compared to dissolution trapping for the long time period? So just what, what I, have I you guess... learned there from your experiments? I guess this my answer is as uh, good as anybody else is that it's be it depends on the site very much. Mm -hmm. I mean we we have this classical picture that I was showing in the beginning and and we we have done it not for this site but we have done it to some sites in in the Baltic Sea we have done model analysis and trying to estimate those effects but I guess you have to I I I I have short answer I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. It depends on the site I guess. It, we talked about the difference between um, the core experiments and the field experiments in terms of the residual saturation. Rather than sort of talking about what the differences are, Idris wonders, is there anything, again, saying very interesting talk, is there anything that from your work uh, with field scale experiments could be learned to improve how we do lab scale experiments to get better estimates of residual trapping in our lab experiments? No, I, <laughs> I, I can. I'm not an expert in laboratory experiments on this kind of experiments that, for example, uh, Stanford was doing here. Now, you know, no, I cannot say how to improve improve those. I, I guess you have had interesting talks here. Actually, I, I followed myself some of these laboratory experiments at this po really poor scale when we look at these processes. There, I guess we are going to we hope to do something new, but that still remains to be seen. And you, know, you mentioned poor scale, so I'll come back. I think that's sort of the last question we have here um, from Marty Bone. Um, and you, you mentioned the, the concept of critical saturation. You, you're just starting to work on this, and Marty um, says, um, "What critical saturation has also been observed during drainage for CCS?" As a result of small scale heterogeneity structures and as a function of flow rate, have you observed this in the research that you're just starting? 
No, we haven't observed that in our research and, and no, <laughs> no. But I saw, I, I'm aware of this. I saw a talk by Sally Benson, I think about this and, and they used the same term, critical saturation. <laughs> But the, the underlying process is different. But I think the, the effect is very similar that you have the delay delay in, in the system becoming connected and, and flowing again, even though in our case, the, the reason is different. I could break in here. Marcia was working for, with Sally for three years. Yeah. Uh, so she, she, she might be just the one who actually did that. Okay, <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> Yes, yes, it was interesting. I, I saw that, uh, saw the presentation, not by you, but, but by Sally. I think these are all the questions we have from the audience. Um, so there's nothing left for me to say other than um, to say thank you very much to the audience for another round of, of excellent questions. And thank you, Auli, once again for a really nice talk. Um, it's, always, as I said, it's always great to see field data and thank you for making the time to give the talk and Time to answer the questions and Hardy over to you. Yes, thanks very much from my side too. I'd like to take the chance to introduce our next speaker. speaker. Uh, next speaker will host Professor Julia de Resente from Heriot Watt University, uh, who will uh, speak about microbial monitoring and control in engineering systems. So we are going to move from the CCS to now micro geo. Uh, sciences, the microbial aspect of reservoir engineering, until next week. Stay happy, healthy, and tuned in, and we wish you all the very best week ahead and weekend ahead, and we see you all again next week, the same time. Uh, enjoy your week. Thanks a lot, Oli. It was an excellent talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah.